I'm Sarah Risk and I'm at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in San Francisco, Region 9, and I'm in the Air Division in the Clean Energy and Climate Change Office. So I came out of college with a degree in environmental sciences with an interdisciplinary focus on the economics policy that can go along with um, the environmental side of things. And so I worked for a little bit at a nonprofit in Oakland um, doing ecological footprinting. And then I, um, I came over to the federal government because a spot opened up just as Obama was coming in. Um, and that spot was in the climate change office. And that's really where my, my interests lie. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to be in the federal government at this point. Not only is it a, a great place to be as a young person coming into this economy, it has good job security and all that, um, it, it also, in order to grapple with climate change, you do need to get the right policies into place. And that does need to happen in government. And so being within government where you can help influence that conversation, I think is a very powerful thing. Yes. I have sort of two aspects to my job. Um, on the one hand, we're constantly getting questions out of the region about what's going on with EPA and climate change. And so in order to answer those questions, we look at what DC is doing, look at what our agency is doing out of headquarters, and look at what the conversations are in Congress and track and follow those discussions. Uh, and then <clears throat> the other side of what we do in the regional office is we look at how can we help solve this problem today. Yeah. <laughs> and so we try and create um, greenhouse gas reductions within our regional footprint. So our region covers um, California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, the tribal nations, and the Pacific Islands. Um, so it's quite a, a <laughs> range. And those yeah. generally what the 900 people in EPA Region 9 do is issue permits and do enforcement on facilities within that footprint. Um, so being in a voluntary side of things where we don't have any regulation yet, um, it creates a, an opportunity to work with people who are forward movers, who want to be doing the right thing and have a little bit of resources but aren't quite sure what to be doing. And so we try and work with those folks and help them overcome barriers um, and get them in conversation with, with people with the right expertise. We work a lot with our communities and with our um, tribal nations as well. Um, we, um, I personally work with cities um, and with landfills. On the local government side, there's a real opportunity because generally they see their citizens wanting to be a greener city um, and they want to be responding to that. But generally, they, um, it's sort of an add-on to the job description of the facilities manager folks. And so all of a sudden, in addition to doing all of their normal um, city functions, they tack on sustainability. <laughs> and so they don't always know what that means, and they don't always know what the best programs are to do in that area for the least amount of effort. And so we try and help them identify the best programs for them to do and help them do that um, you know, while, while being sensitive to what they want to accomplish in their community because we really want them to take it on as their project and only provide you know, a little bit of support on the, on the sidelines to keep them going and, um, and, and make the right connections with folks who can really help them move that conversation. And then um, I mentioned landfills as well. As you may know, um, methane comes off of landfills largely off of organics in landfills, but there are other sources as well. And that methane has uh, 22 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So if you let that <clears throat> just go into the atmosphere, you have pretty big warming. And if you instead um, can use it for energy or use it for vehicle fueling, then you can start to make use of that fuel. And um, it is methane is the main component in natural gas. And so it can be used pretty much as natural gas if you clean it up a little bit. And so that is a beneficial use. So I call up landfill owners <laughs> and try and get them to do this. Um, so so there's, there's a, a bit of everything, really. So would you say that um, for each individual company, there's a like you were talking about what programs are best for them. Is it specific to the program or is there sort of a general 
thing that everybody should be doing? Um, generally, everybody should be doing energy efficiency. It makes sense. You can do it now. Um, it, you can get an auditor in, come look at your light bulbs, your fixtures, and, um, and see if there are improvements to be made. Generally, those have paybacks associated with them. You can make money off of it, and, um, and they can sometimes even help you pay for renewable power if that's something you're interested in pursuing. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we try and uh, message on sort of across the board um, because it has the economic and the environmental benefit. Um, and then, you know, I think for most people, we really try and listen to what they want and try and help them accomplish those goals. Well, there, there's a, a program at a headquarters that I work with on this. So it, it's an agency-wide um, voluntary program that you can enroll in as a landfill owner or operator. And so I work with them, and, and there are a few other regions that work on it as well. Um, although our, our region tends to do a little bit more on it. <laughs> we, we like to be out in front. So, um, so I, um, yeah, so it is a region nine um, thing. And, and one thing that we have been working on in general is biogas in general, whether it's from dairies, whether it's from wastewater treatment plants or, um, or anaerobic digesters where you put all your food in an um, anaerobic digester and get the gas off of it and use it for energy harvesting. Um, we funded some projects in that area and so looking for that type of beneficial use, we, we try and encourage it. And we do look at, at policy barriers and, and try and address those as well. Region 9, basically we try and understand what's going on with these bills. They're very long and complicated, uh, you know, running a thousand pages more or less. And so it's tough. We don't really have the capacity to, to sleuth through it to the degree that folks in Washington do, because um, that's not our, our primary function. Um, but, but we do get a lot of questions about it from people like you and, and others. And, um, and so we do try and understand it. And an EPA actually provides an economic and environmental assessment of uh, congressional bills. So we have provided that for Waxman Markey. And we have also um, looked at it for the Kerry Boxer bill that was introduced to the Senate in November. Um, <clears throat> we have not yet completed that for the Kerry Lieberman bill that was introduced into the Senate in May. Um, but, but the main thing about all of these bills is that they set targets for reductions. Um, they make large investments into energy efficiency and renewable energy, into our transportation systems, and into our um, energy systems as a delivery system. And they um, create mechanisms for us to reduce carbon from our most intensive industries. So, EPA um, believes that, this, that these bills will help us advance our um, energy efficiency, reduce reliance on oil, help build jobs in America to recover from, <coughs> excuse me, to recover the economy. And um, that, that, that the way that these bills are set up is really to stimulate that growth within the United States. Um, so we're seeing a lot of outsourcing of solar panels to China. Um, and, and really, you know, if we're going to create a um, clean energy economy in the United States, we need to be doing that here. So that, those bills do have provisions to grow the American economy, um, which is um, another function that we can pursue as we try and transition over to al alternative energy resources. There, there are definitely differences between the bills, and, um, and you do have to get into the nitty-gritty of the bill in order to start to tease those out. Um, what we look at is how it affects EPA authority. Um, so the Clean Air Act um, is our existing authority. This is a law that already exists and which we um, have to implement. And um, the Supreme Court has ruled that EPA needs to look at um, under the Clean Air Act, will 
carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, do they pose a threat to human health and welfare? We ruled that, that greenhouse gases endanger um, human health and welfare in the United States and that the science clearly supported this. And we um, further ruled, because, because this litigation had come out of a request, a petition to EPA to regulate new motor vehicles, um, we further ruled that um, emissions from new motor vehicles do cause and contribute to atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide that do pose a threat to human health and welfare. And so that, um, that, that rulemaking really cemented our regulatory necessity to go ahead and regulate under the Clean Air Act. So we have been taking steps to do that. And, um, and we, have, we have put out a um, light duty vehicle rule. We've put out a tailoring rule, which will affect stationary sources. And these are all part of regulating greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. Now, if Congress comes in and passes something else, that does affect our authority under the Clean Air Act. All of the bills that have been introduced do affect EPA's existing authority under that act. So if we, um, and, and they, they vary a little bit in how they affect it. Uh, for the most part, um, they're basically saying under the Clean Air Act, you can have a criteria pollutant, which are mostly local um, pollutants that increase your local air quality problems. So um, NOx, SOx, PM, um, things that give you asthma. Um, and then you have hazardous air pollutants, um, which come from hazardous toxins. <laughs> and so basically, the, the legislation rules that you can't, have, um, you can't have it listed as one of these types of pollutants. Um, it can't be listed as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act under that Title I section. So, um, so it would mean that you would have to address it separately. And that's where they create these cap and trade programs. And so they handle it separately under the cap and trade. And then you, have, you still have some performance-based standards for coal-fired power plants that EPA would regulate independently. So there is a little bit of interplay um, between what Congress does and our existing authority. But we have been moving down the path of regulating under the Clean Air Act as we are um, have been directed to by the Supreme Court in the United States. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, our administrator and President Obama have both um, expressed interest in pursuing um, congressional legislation in lieu of our current regulatory path because, because carbon dioxide just isn't a local pollutant. <laughs> it's a global pollutant and it needs to be handled in a slightly different way. So it's, it's, it's possible to do it under the Clean Air Act, and we will do it under the Clean Air Act if Congress does nothing. Um, but, but there are other routes. I believe my agency has not taken a formal opinion on this, so I'll speak personally as to my personal opinions on that matter. Um, we've seen that in the US negotiations in Copenhagen, the international um, negotiations there that they agreed upon a target um, and we've seen this also in the US legislation that there have been targets that are outlined in the beginning of the of the bill and then supporting items and 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 hopefully those all add up <laughs> to the amount that you are aiming for in the long run um, and it's a transition it's it's hard to know exactly how we will be able to transition our, cell, our entire energy economy over to a new source of fuel. It's going to be a long period of time, and it's, it's going to create um, a lot of unhappiness for a lot of people who are making money off of the current system. Um, so, so given those, I think you know, what's useful about it is that it, um, it creates an endpoint that's based on the science. Um, and that basically the scientists have said, look, this is, 
<laughs> this is where you need to be, and it, and it stakes it to that science. So the fact that it is related to the science and that it, um, it is aspirational, I think is good. Um, and, and then, you know, how do it, is it accomplishable and how, what are the steps to get there is where I start to get a little bit anxious about, well, does this, does it really work as you're saying? And, and the truth is we don't know. <laughs> but if, if you, um, you know, if you set a goal, at least that's a starting place for the conversation. And I think we've seen this is a very, very difficult conversation to have with folks because there's so many people invested in maintaining the status quo and so, um, and in improving their country and, you know, many other, many other things that come into play here, especially at the international level. Um, and so, and so it's a useful place to start that conversation. So I think from that perspective, it's very powerful because it says, look, the science says we need to be here. Let's agree to that. And if you can get everybody's buy-in on that endpoint, then you can start more effectively having the conversation back to how do we get there from today. So I don't know if we'll make it or not. Um, <laughs> we're starting to see local governments set these goals. We're starting to, I mean, California set these goals. I think they're a good starting place because they're based on science and they start the conversation. And, and we'll see how well we can do. California had submitted a California waiver request to EPA under the previous administration. Um, and we had denied that um, waiver request under the previous administration. So when Lisa Jackson came in um, under Obama, she um, decided to grant that waiver instead. Um, and this was all happening at the same time as the president was trying to set fuel economy standards in the United States and have that conversation um, not only with the EPA in California, but also with the Department of Transportation and with auto manufacturers. Um, and so he looked at what California had drafted and, um, and wanted to come up with something that served the needs of the nation. And, and California is always drafting good pieces of legislation, which we borrow at the federal level. Um, and, and, and we don't usually lift the whole thing and just take it as is. We take pieces of it. Um, but, but it can be very effective in helping us figure out, well, California looked at doing it this way. And, and politically as well, you know, California um, California's buy-in to it was, was really crucial because, because the auto manufacturers didn't like that there was this patchwork of regulations emerging where California wanted one kind of car and then 13 other states hopped on the bandwagon and they all wanted that kind of car as well. And so for the auto manufacturers, it was a headache. They didn't want to have to be producing a certain type of car for these you know, scattered 13 states and then producing a different type of car for everybody else in the United States. So, so it came out of a conversation um, between EPA, Department of Transportation, um, auto manufacturers, um, and California was a definite part of that conversation. Um, so, so yeah, it, it was part of that um, initiative. And, and what's interesting as well from an agency perspective is we've never had a joint rulemaking with another agency. And, and that rulemaking was a joint rulemaking with Department of Transportation. So they have historically set our CAFE standards, or corporate average fuel economy standards, um, which are the miles per gallon on your, on your average fleet in the United States. Um, and EPA complemented that rulemaking with a um, grams of CO2 per mile traveled <laughs> um, <laughs> ruling. And so, and so it varies based on the footprint of your, of your car. Um, if you have a smaller car, you, you can't emit as much. Um, but then because it, it works alongside the Department of Transportation, which is based on the average fleet in the US, um, they complement each other. And, um, and it's, it's a really great thing because it's really nice to have the agencies talking to one another and making rules that mesh with one another. Um, and, um, 
and and it's great to have buy-in from all these different folks. So it was one of the first things that Obama did when he came in, and um, I think it, it showed the power of having that conversation. Sure. Well, um, pace is one one thing that um, that we've looked at in California and, and has gotten some national attention. Joe Biden has talked about it. It's property assessed clean energy. It's something that Berkeley started, um, and they um, under their Berkeley First program, they basically started looking at this problem, which is people buy a house and um, they don't know how long they're going to own it. I mean, if you're buying a house, probably you think you're going to own it for a while, but maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, you start to get a little bit uncertain about where your future is and do you want to stay in this house. Um, and so when you have a payback period on a solar panel that's 20 years long, um, it makes a lot of sense if you know you're going to stay in that house for 20 years, but if you don't know if you're going to leave, then it starts to make less sense. So what they did is they um, they put it on the property tax of the of the um, of the building, so that as you as the property owner are paying your taxes, um, you are financing that solar panel. So basically, you're paying the same amount you would be paying to the utility, and instead you're paying for your solar panel. And if you sell the house, that cost is passed on to the new owner. And um, and basically, this creates a system for you not to worry about the 20-year payback, but in, in order to turn it over with those savings. And at the end of 20 years, you have a solar panel, and you don't have to pay for energy costs anymore, which is pretty cool. So this is something that was a local initiative. We've talked with Berkeley about it, and we've talked with um, others about spreading this program to other states and other areas. Um, and, and Joe Biden has expressed his support for it as well. Um, so it's, it's always interesting to see um, there are those local, local programs that do bubble up to the national attention. Um, and, and those are the ones that we try and really develop our local relationships with those players so that um, we can help share their story effectively. It's all voluntary. So they're only going to do it if they want to do it. So we can try and make a good economic argument to them. Um, and we can talk about the air quality and water quality impacts or, or waste um, hazardous waste impacts of their operations, and and we have been um, been doing a, a bit of looking at well you can improve your local air quality by investing in renewables and that not only deals with your local air pollution but also helps us address global warming, um, but. But as far as you know, these big industries, they're really they're 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 only going to really respond to regulation. Uh, there there are a few leaders in there who want to be doing the right thing and are showing corporate leadership. And those leaders are generally a part of our um, voluntary partnership programs, be it our Green Power Partnership, which shows that you're purchasing renewable energy, um, our Climate Leaders Program, which shows that you're reducing your overall um, emissions from your business, um, or several others and a whole slew of ones that we have. Those corporate leaders, do we do try and give them some recognition for what they're doing. But it's generally self-motivated. Um, and there's not much we can do as a regulator who can't regulate carbon dioxide um, to, to force them to do anything at this point. Um, so, so we'll have to wait for regulation to really get at the big pieces of the pie, I think. Um, maybe it'll happen through corporate leadership. but. Um, they have a, a business model that, that works pretty well. It makes a huge difference. It really does. Um, we have published um, data which reframes the greenhouse gas inventory in the U.S. from the normal way you see it presented, which is industry, residential, commercial, into materials and management viewpoint, which looks at, um, well, of of our products, <laughs> how much, how much of our greenhouse gases really come back to delivering products to consumers, and and when you reframe it in that light, um, you start to see that this is absolutely huge, and so I think it comes with um, 
it's harder to measure those types of impacts because they, in, they have upstream implications throughout the system and quantifying those can be very difficult. But that doesn't mean that they're not huge. <laughs> and what we can see when we do it on a big scale and look at it in the US inventory is that they are absolutely astronomical and way bigger than anybody ever <laughs> imagined they would be. Um, a huge amount of our, our energy goes into delivering products to people in the United States. And, um, and so what products you buy, <laughs> how, how they're packaged, and what you do with that packaging makes a really big difference in, in your personal carbon footprint. And some personal, you know, there are a slew of these online personal carbon footprint calculators. Some of them capture that and some of them don't to varying degrees. As I said, it's difficult to quantify. But I mean, these, these, how many times you go shopping in a year, huge impact where you go shopping, where that clothing was made, <laughs> where, um, you know, what that packaging looks like is just going to have a, an astronomical effect on, on um, carbon emissions in the United States. Um, and our, our diversion rates are not that good right now. Um, in, in San Francisco, it's quite good because we have a, a really great recycling program here and, and curbside composting, which is quite amazing. Um, <clears throat> I, I believe the national diversion rate for um, recycling is around 35%. Um, if we went up to 100%, um, I believe we would see 300 million metric tons of carbon dioxide reduced annually. It is a huge, huge number. And it's not that hard to do. <laughs> it's just a matter of throwing your can in the right bin. Um, and, and you see similar, um, similar, a little bit less, but similar numbers when you look at composting. And composting is something San Francisco's doing, but pretty much, not very few other, um, other people in the nation are doing that at all right now. Um, so that's another area we have been developing our programs in, is trying to assist local governments in setting up those types of programs, because it, it does matter to you as an individual um, in, in your ability to participate in these more sustainable activities, be it bringing a, a grocery bag to, to the um, grocery store or whatnot. If, you're, if the infrastructure is there, are there recycling bins all over the place? Are there compost, curbside composting? Can you recycle your plastic bags at your local grocery store? And you know these types of things, you wanna make it easy for people to do. So it's the local government or the state or whoever who can help set up these. Usually it's the local government who's setting up these types of programs. And so that's very important, but then it's also important to complement that with personal behavior because if you, um, we, we um, in Region 9, we've been um, working on moving towards zero waste and carbon neutrality for our business operations. And we've seen even in our pilot phase, if you have even one person who is not participating in that behavior, it can have a huge impact on your waste streams. And, and you know, and so, Figuring out how to get everybody on board, be it in your school, in your organization, wherever you are, um, is a very powerful thing to be, to be doing as an individual within that organization. Right, there aren't regulations for it right now, so... Um, so maybe you know at some point in the future, regulations are constantly evolving field, and and we we do try and um, try and push those regulations to the degree that we that we can to be environmentally responsible. But at the same time, as the federal government, we also want to give the state and the local um, players a chance to show leadership or um, create their own programs that work for them. So we do want to be sensitive to that as well. Right now, there's no regulation for, for, um, for composting or for recycling. But um, who knows? <laughs>